So welcome to the High Value Customer Podcast, the show for business leaders to learn how to attract and retain high value customers. This week's guest is Terry Finity from Reconsulting. Terry's based in London and Reconsulting also has an office in Amsterdam. Reconsulting helps newly appointed CEOs of fast growth tech companies to create an environment where success is inevitable by building a concrete strategy and an organization inspired to deliver it. How are you doing today, Terry? You well? Very good, Chris. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So perhaps we can kick things off. Um, could you just give us a little bit of an intro story as to how you've got to where you're at in your career to date? Sure thing. I started my consulting career at Anderson back in the uh, 1980s, believe it or not, so quite, quite a long time ago. And, and at the time I noticed and you know, I was kind of frustrated that what we tended to do is deliver reports and recommendations and they didn't always happen. So you know, I agitated a bit and I got put in job of uh, a global research team to figure out how to make consulting more effective and how to get better implementation. So we made a lot of positive changes and, and uh, improved what we did for a bit, but we saw a big hole in uh, our capability, which is all around people and change. So the next phase was I um, did research around the world and I thought the best thing going right then for uh, how to get people on board and, and, and how to build a really healthy high performing organization was coming out of MIT and the organizational learning center head by Peter Senge. So for two years, I ran a program training about 150 consultants in how to take the concepts coming out of MIT and organizational learning and say, how do you build them into building a, a really valuable um, really valuable change program that people get excited about and they get on board, they get on the same page. And, and we found it you know, fantastic and I learned tons out of it and uh, that worked well. And uh, then following that, we um, purchased a small company in, that worked in retail and they focused on leadership development programs. And uh, I was responsible for integrating them into what we were doing. And through a couple of years of that, we learned two things. We learned that when you ran programs based on, focused on leadership and culture and behavior, that people love going through because they learn a lot personally. But if that's all you did, six months later, it was like, that was a great program, but it had no impact. Um, but we found is if you did that where it was tied to a real important strategic objective of change, then it could be the key to unlocking that and making a big impact. So. Um, so I love that work because uh, you know the clients get the most out of it. It's really fascinating. It puts people at the heart of everything you do. And so after Anderson collapsed, I found it reconsulting. And the whole purpose there was to work with ambitious leaders who really want to make a difference and integrate the hard side of strategy, like the process and planning and, and all the thinking, which is really necessary with the actual heart of it, which people think is the soft side, which is getting everyone on board, the leadership, culture, and engagement. So since 2003, that's what we've been focused on. So you set up your company in 2003. Correct. Cool. So talk to me. Um, I know a little bit from your from your introduction. Uh, you work with fast growth uh, tech companies with a newly appointed CEO. So talk to me about um, who would who would you be your ideal customer? Yeah? What would be sort of ten out of ten in terms of all of the things that you look for, where well, they would love doing business with you and you would love doing business with them. Well, I think, I think the CEO has to have high aspirations, really want to get something meaningful done, uh, not just kind of tick a box. And not only that, they want to make a difference, but they realize that a big part of the puzzle is uh, getting their senior team working really well and setting the right culture and behaviors across the organization as they do that. If they believe that, then what we offer really appeals to them, and we know we can help them add tons of value and, and ha have a great relationship. So that's, that's our ideal customer. And the reason we say newly appointed CEOs, about 80% of our business is with that, is because usually you've been in the job for a short time, you've got the team you want now, and you understand the real scale of the challenge. And you say, well, I've got to make an impact in the next three to five years. And now I really want to get everyone in the organization. And I, you know, I want to be crystal clear. I want to progress it. I want to know I'm on track. And I want everybody pulling together in the same way. And, and when, when that's the case, then, then we, can, we can add a lot of value. And they, they have other things that, that, that sit there as well. They really understand or uh, respond to or resonate with some of the people issues we come across. So, for instance, we often mention about, um, you know, avoiding what we call the CEO disease. You know, in a lot of organizations, people don't actually say, they say what the CEO wants, think what they think the CEO wants to hear, not what they really need to hear. And so we say, you know, if you want to make, make sure that people are really giving it to you straight, then, you know, we're going to help you do that. So we're going to work on, on you know, creating an environment where people raise issues with you. And, and, and also with each other. You know, you want to know BS, executive team and senior management team. We worked with a tech company a few years ago where their whole strategy was dependent on building an ecosystem. You know, other 
uh, professional services firms and tech firms, systems integrators who could sell and deliver and implement their, their software. And yet through the interviews and watching the debates of the exact team, it was crystal clear that at least half the team didn't believe it would work. And yet everyone was nodding agreement with the strategy that was never gonna happen. So our job was to say, hang on, there's a whole bunch of things you're saying in what we call the left-hand column. You know, the, if, you, if you did a conversation about, I'm saying I agree with the strategy and you could write down what I said in the right-hand column, you could take a piece of paper in the left-hand column put down what you're thinking and feeling and not saying. And that's like, we'll never build an ecosystem. Accenture will never sell our software. And we make sure all those left-hand column issues get put on the table. And if you describe that to CEO and they say, that's exactly the type of problem I've got right now, then I know they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna be great clients because they're gonna realize that you have to work on that type of thing. You know, you have to invest time in how we work as a team, align not only on the content of the strategy, but how you're gonna to work to deliver it. And then your leaders are gonna to have to spend time really inspiring and motivating everyone down the line and, and, and invest and commit to that. So those are ideal clients. You know, I've got a, um, you know, I've got a high ambition. I know getting my team working well together is a really important part of it and getting everyone on board is important. And I want someone to can help me do that and, and, and do it in a way that I know I'm on track. I guess, uh, you know, if somebody joins a fast growing tech company is going to have a fairly kind of strong, um, set of objectives you know, put to him by the board so that I guess they're anticipating there's going to be a bunch of changes that need to be made. Um, interesting to know a little bit about how um, uh, does, you mentioned um, the, that they want a sort of no BS kind of environment. Um, it sounds like a bit like the emperor's new clothes, you know, he's walking around there <laughs> in naked and everyone's telling them how great he is. I mean, that sounds like a, a pretty tough thing to, to, to implement. I guess you must help the company make the, the people below the CEO feel comfortable to, you know, raise those kind of issues. Cause I can imagine a lot of time people just feel like they're going to get shot down or, you know, they're going to get sacked for saying the, you know, the most obvious thing. That <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, but this is why we, uh, you know, back to what I talked about in my earlier days in my career with Anderson and then setting up reconsulting. This is why I like to integrate that uh, the cultural and behavior elements with building the strategy. And you say, look, as leaders, you're gonna have to set the environment. You have to set the environment where people will put their hand up if they see an issue. And, and where they'll be happy to talk to their boss or their boss's boss about problems they see. And if you don't have that, then you know, you're gonna be in trouble. And when, when things change really quickly, it's gonna take a long time for the signals to get from your developers or your front end salespeople back into the decision makers. So it's, it is hard, but it's, it's really critical. And, and the whole core to it is building a culture where, you know, we call it people have authentic conversations. When they have an issue, they have a way to respectfully raise it and they put it on the table. And one of the leaders' job is to make it really clear to people, that's what we want, that's what we need. You know, it was interesting with one of our other clients, their, you know, their core strategy was building an open platform. Really, you know, it's a, it's a hugely relevant strategy for a lot of tech companies. So the great example everyone looks at is say, say you know, if you look at salesforce.com, you know, they started as a kind of low cost CRM and they built a platform that people could develop on. They've, you know, they've, they've been hugely successful. So we, we had a client doing a similar strategy. And, you know, before we were involved, they had all sorts of communication around our open platform. They're doing X, Y, Z. But we got them through a process where all the developers were saying, hey, we've got 500 people here, here in Mumbai and not one of us is working on this open platform. So I keep hearing about it, but none of our development resources focus on it. Like what the hell's going on? And, you know, you could end up trying to push a strategy without it really happening and not, not find out. So that's part of our role is to make it transparent. You know, how are you going to measure where that's happening and how do people to hand up, put their hand up when it, uh, when it doesn't work. So um, you, you sound like you've got quite a clear idea on who your ideal customer is now. Um, when you started the business in 2003, you know, do you think that you had such a clear idea as to who that ideal customer was then or has it evolved over, uh, over a period of time? A bit of both. A bit of both. Uh, we were fairly clear. We hadn't articulated the way we might now, mm. and we had less of a focus on um, new CEOs. That's kind of, you know, just by serendipity came about. But we did know we wanted people who thought uh, leadership and culture and engagement was part of what makes strategy work. We knew if they didn't like that, then we were going to be doing boring work that didn't deliver. Deliver. And and we also thought that we could put something together that would appeal to people who we're skeptical of just doing leadership development training as powerful as that can be. And one of our early clients was, was the CEO and uh, I was really surprised we did a direct marketing campaign. So we wrote like 250 letters. We just set the business up, you know, and I've gone from a big brand to like, you know, two, there was two of us and nobody knew who the hell we were. 
So I wrote these letters out, and most most of them we got no response, or people calling up saying, "Don't send this crap like that before you know." I don't want to cold call letters. And I was just sitting in the office, and I got a phone call one evening, and, and this woman said, "Oh, I'm so and so secretary." And I was expecting her to tell me, "Don't send a letter like that." He said, "I could you do you know could you make a meeting um, next week?" You know. So I went to see see the CEO and his HR director, and his storyline was something like this. He said, "I've got an exec team where everyone wanted my job." And they kind of hate the fact that I've got it. And I've basically also announced a strategy that's put the share options underwater because it's a long-term investment strategy. So everybody's pretty angry with me and it's really dysfunctional. And everyone I talk to who says they can help me with that problem is asking me to go you know, offsite somewhere in the woods and build a raft and learn about team building and then take those lessons back in how we work as a team. And what helped us get the job is we said, look, that, that can be interesting and you can learn a lot of stuff, but people have a hard time saying how's that relevant to this the real work issue. So said, instead of building a raft in the woods, why don't you actually get the same leadership development input while you build a strategy together? So something you have to execute on. And, 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 and that started to shape who we thought. So there's a, there's a client who said, you know what? I do need to invest in the people side. I do need to figure out how our team works together. And I want to apply all that learning, not in a training room and then figure out what to do with it, but do it live as we go through a process that you facilitate around our strategy. And then that led us to, you know, two or three year engagement with your know, leading media company. And it was fantastic, a really, really, really interesting job. So we started to see that if there was, if there's um, interest in the people side and a requirement for a strategy, a real focus on delivery, then, then we've got some, something uh, really viable to offer. You mentioned to me um, in, our, in, our, in our previous conversation that your business has gone on a bit of a transition from a more of a project-based kind of, um, deliverables versus you know transitioning into more of a retainer based business and you, you mentioned that you had a, a case study that you could share a little bit about and perhaps you could explain a little bit about that, that particular yeah, customer. yeah yeah and it, it was um, yeah we, we worked years ago with a, a you know set top box company and they were like um, 180 million in revenue and uh, and struggling really and uh, I think they're number 15 in the world and and the CEO was quite skeptical of training and development. And his HR director had been a client of ours at Capital One. We did a big leadership development program for them. And she, she really loved the work we did. So um, she said, why don't you come up and meet the CEO? But I, he thinks consultants are a waste of time. And he's not very big on, on soft, touchy-feely stuff. So I don't know whether it's worth your time to come up, come up for, for, for the journey. But, uh, but anyhow, so, so I did. And, and, and we, did, we did try to, you know, we hit it off pretty well. And we helped them build a breakthrough strategy and we really helped clean up and improve how the leadership team worked and got them on track. And over four years, we worked with them and they grew to about 2 billion in revenue, number one in the world, you know, fantastic success story. And, uh, and obviously they achieved it all. We, we helped facilitate it, but you know, Neil was ha- you know comfortable enough to publicly give us a recommendation and we wouldn't have got this done without, without our support. And, and so really pleased with that. But one thing that made us start thinking about how we moved the subscription is the first engagement with them was a project to get the strategy done and improve the leadership team and, and you know get a cascade of so to speak so everyone in the organization's behind it but, but uh, neil saw the value in developing the team over time so for those four years every quarter we would come together with the exec team we do a sense check against the strategy we test the assumptions we challenge what was working and not working we we make sure that the uh, conversations and quality of interactions were being maintained. So we kind of did a temperature check on the, the, the senior team as an exec team, identify what critical issues are, make sure they're focused on it each quarter, touch base, and did that over four years. And, and uh, that was hugely successful. And then I think helpful from that, them that, um, you know, made a live process over that time rather than a one-off project to, to deliver strategies. So we're, you know, increasingly looking to customers and saying, look, work with us, we'll do some work up front and, and help you get your strategy on board. But, you know, it's at least a 12 to 24 months uh, engagement where we're involved regularly um, to manage, you know, the kind of interactions you have, do a sense check against it, give you feedback and challenge and, and, and make sure it stays on track. I'd imagine the accountability for actually getting the strategy implemented goes up. If you have, you know, somebody coming back to you on a regular basis and saying, have you done this thing? You know, the thing you said you was going to do, like, as it actually happened. And um, I guess it's, it's a kind of have to be a lonely place at the top of a company when you're not actually accountable to a, another human being necessarily. I mean, I guess some of them will have boards and what have you, but, you know, in terms of uh, in the role that you would provide, I guess is a bit of an accountability kind of. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of dimensions of that. So one of the things that gets in the way of really high-performing organizations is a lack of uh, accountability and holding each other to account, almost an embarrassment to avoid conflict. So you'll see uh, two things will happen. Someone will commit to doing something. It won't get done, and, and nobody will say anything, but everyone's sitting there thinking, well, I thought we all agreed we're going to be, you know, we make a, a decision on building this new warehouse or distribution center by June. You know, it's, it's August and nothing's happening. And yet nobody says anything. And as soon as that happens, people start thinking like, what the hell is going on? I, you know, I'm busting my rear end to do what I said I do. And, you know, Bob over here, nobody says anything and, and he's not done it. So are we serious? So lack of holding people to account sometimes comes from not having the trust and environment where you feel you can challenge someone effectively and still maintain it. So you avoid conflict and, and then the accountability thing falls away. And what we do is we bring a process to say, we're going to make everything in the strategy concrete so you can measure it. And we're going to make progress transparent. So that, and we're not going to say, um, it's bad to say you're behind on something, but let's acknowledge it. I'm, I'm behind. And because that, you need to then learn from it. Are we behind because we're doing it wrong? Or are we behind because we are fundamentally wrong on our strategic assumptions we need to change? Or are we behind some of the resources? And what decisions have to come from that? So if we create that environment to work, that, that's quite helpful. And the CEO then moves away from kind of, I don't know, staying awake at night wondering, so I wonder, I wonder what, what I'm going to find out next quarterly with you, uh, to being pretty confident he or she can see, see progress. And, and as you say, they quite often then have to go up to the board and say, where are we? And if the team's built a really clear, concrete strategy with, with milestones and, and, and the CEO knows that he's getting the full story about it, he or she can go to the board confident to say, look, we're promising, say, say it's a PE on board. We have a lot of clients like that. Exits planned in two and a half years. You know, it requires us to achieve these seven milestones, and we're on, we're on board for five. These are two we're behind on. We're looking for more investment to get these done, or whatever it is we're doing. So it makes a, you know, makes everything more transparent. There's a bit of a risk in that. It means if you're behind, you can't hide it. But but everybody knows, you know, what's happening, and that's really really important for uh, driving success. And and, and you know, the, the CEO uses our process to get that accountability with the whole team, but you create an environment where they hold each other to account. And the other thing that gets us back into the subscription stuff and the monthly bits um, is we develop some proprietary software that uh, actually translates the concrete strategy into visual maps and milestones as well as measurable progress. But then uh, it on a monthly basis updates progress and raises issues that are behind and actions that need to come about. It's pretty simple, but it's really powerful. Most uh, other software tools out there are either very complex, um, developing every KPI in the world, and that's great if you want a big KPI system, or very much uh, task and project management level, and that's great if you're a project manager managing tasks, but we hadn't found anything we could use that was really good at saying, look, we got X number of strategic initiatives, quarter by quarter, what are the milestones we have to hit? Have we hit them? And if we haven't, what are we doing about it? And then you have a really focused conversation about what do we have to do to get back on track? And so we provide that on a monthly basis. There's a monthly fee for that. And, and then on a quarterly basis, we get together and help facilitate the debate about are we really taking the actions we need to take. So put, get your crystal ball out and talk to me about what you think the future looks like for your ideal customers. Uh, but that's, a, that's a good one right now. If you think about the whole post-COVID world, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a more uncertain future than it has been for a long time. Because um, even if you're in a business, like I've got a, a couple of clients whose businesses were relatively unscathed because of the, you know, the, the sectors they're serving, um, but even they, you know, they're un, they're uncertain about um, what's going to be the overall economic impact of this, and how will that affect our customers? And, and, and if it does, you know, for instance, we've got a client who's selling software to, to banks. Well, if six, twelve months down, all the, uh, you know, all all the uh, small business support loans start defaulting and the government doesn't really offer guarantees, what's that going to do to their IT budgets for a software company? So even if you haven't been kind of knocked for a loop um, through the lockdowns that have happened around most, most of the world, you're facing a really uncertain um, uncertain economy. So, so one thing that's different now is like, there's going to be a heck of a lot of change and uncertainty. And a lot of people also said, well, we're all working from home now. So one thing that's clear, we're going to be more working from home, maybe less people in the office. But that's not, you know, it's not just, oh, we're all using Zoom now. Okay, that's great. We're using it more than we used to. But what about all the um, other things that have to happen in the business? Are you going to um, say, I want people in the office sometimes, uh, say for admin and, and white collar staff? And if so, 
Do they all come at the same time? How do you schedule it? How do you work the logistics of it? I know some clients are having trouble with how do we onboard people? You know, if you're well established and you're in a team that exists, maybe you can do remote working. No other one. You know, I was talking to a young marketing manager. She's only joined a few months before lockdown. And she, you know, she can't talk to anybody there unless she books a Zoom call. And they're, they're totally, you know, up to here with Zoom calls. So uh, that process is normally knocking the door saying, I'm having trouble with X. You know, how do you actually learn on the job when you're remote? And the only interactions you have are uh, formally booked meetings, you know, through, through, through a video conference. So almost every process needs to be re- needs to be re- rethought and, and, and designed around what's happening. But you also need... Uh, to think about the scenarios that are happening out there. And, and I think what we are calling strateg- agile strategy is really more important than ever. And by that, I mean, you know, agile gets thrown around a lot as a, you know, I think poorly understood term for, are we talking about the same thing as agile strategy development or what are we talking about, or agile, you know, software development, what are we talking about? But to us, it's even more important than it has been, been before, but it's, um, you need to be really explicit about your strategic assumptions and you need to document them. And then you need to be pretty regularly checking and saying, we call it feed forward rather than feedback. And everyone does feedback. We plan to do X and did it work or not. This is like, do I learn my way into the future? We assumed X is going to happen. It isn't happening. What does that mean for us? Is it just because it's taking longer than we expected or are we fundamentally wrong? So we've been working with, with a couple of our clients. It's that monthly agile sprints, we call it, or strategy, strategy sprints. So every month, that's test check on, on what we expected. And, and people are doing more robust uh, testing on, the, um, on what we call simple scenarios. And, and, and that's often misunderstood as well. A lot of people um, say, you know, I, I, I do a lot of scenario planning. And what that means for some people is, you know, we did a scenario where we're growing at 20% a year. We did a scenario where we're growing at 10% a year, and we ran with those two models. Okay. That's one thing. But the scenario, you know, you can build more or less complex scenarios. When I go back to that set top box example, uh, just to give it a sim- simple example back in uh, this was late 2000s, you know, there's a big question in the set top box world when is that going to be replaced by the internet? You know, it's hard to remember now, but Netflix has just started. It was still delivering CDs, you know, DVDs or DVDs, I mean, and uh, it just started streaming. And so we helped them build a structure which said, look, there's two big uncertainties we face. It's like right now, Channel Plus and DirecTV and Sky, they own all the content. But maybe someday in the future, non-TV players will start buying content. What would that do? And we think it'll happen, but we have no idea when or if. And then the other dimension was, Right now, you can't have a good TV experience uh, without a set-top box in the home, but maybe someday you'll be able to get that over the web and watch on any device. And if you put those into two, uh, a typical consultant, four by four plugin, and you turn around and say, look, you need a device and Sky has all the content, well, set-top box business is pretty secure. Sky buys set-top boxes from us. But if it changes and Apple buys all the content and they don't have set-top boxes, then they're streaming it live over Netflix or Netflix has the content, well, what does that look like? And uh, how do you prepare for that? And it isn't an exercise in predicting that future, but for each one, each quadrant, you say, look, you know, what would be the early warning signals of this possible future coming up? What would be the drivers of it? What do we pay attention to? So it's things like, there's no way streaming is going to work if you can't get 20 megabytes a second to 20% of the population in urban areas. It just won't work. So when you start seeing that happening, you should be cautious. And and when you start seeing cord cutting, people canceling their cable or satellite subscriptions, you should be aware of it. When you see takeoff of subscriptions in Netflix, you should be aware of it. So for each quadrant, you have your early warning uh, signal set up. For all our clients now, doing that type of thinking is even more important because it really is uncertain out there. So defining the uncertainties and getting sensitive to what they might bring about. You can't predict it, but you need to have what's the really important things that we need to focus on and how do we make our strategy robust against each of these possible futures. That's going to be one of the biggest impacts that we're, that we're, that we're going to have to deal with. You know, being more agile and robust for a world that's more uncertain than it has been, at least for the next couple of years. And you know, then, then there's other things that were there regardless of COVID. You know, the whole shift to social, corporate social responsibility, you know, uh, you know, B corporations, all that type of thing. Like, how do you actually get it become a purpose-driven corporation where you're doing the things that matter and contributing to societies, you know, the big change that everybody's facing. And, um, and, and uh, of course, in, in a lot of industries, the whole, what is going to be the shift as, as we decarbonize the economy? And what does that mean for us? So, so those are things that, that uh, people have to be aware of. But the biggest thing is that 
and, and particularly for our technology companies, you know, what does it mean for your development teams and your recruitment and retention of people when you're not running in big development centers and everybody working there together? Like imagine you've got three clients whose development teams are about a third or outsourced Eastern Europe and India. You know, India is, you know, rapidly accelerating COVID. What's that going to do to your development centers? So that's the biggest thing that they're dealing with right now. So it sound, just to sort of paraphrase a little bit, it sounds like, um, you know, a lot of companies are probably doing risk assessments on, you know, whether they're going to like get people complaining and back pain or whatever sitting in their yeah. desks, but they're probably not doing a risk assessment on the assumptions that they're making in their, in their business strategy and what you're sort of uh, saying that the, f- the future looks like is a bit of, you know, I suppose, you know, to put it in layman's terms, a bit of a risk assessment around, um, you know, the strategic direction of the company. Yeah, so it is risk assessment, but it's slightly more than that. It's uh, building learning capability in a way. So this whole, all this scenario stuff I talked about, what it does is it makes you more sensitive to all the possible things that might come about. So yeah, that's likely to be blindsided. And the requirement's going to be moving more quickly when this unexpected future comes about. Mm. So the whole reason culture is important is as you start seeing something that isn't what you expect it, you quickly adapt to it because you had thought about it as a possibility. And your people put their hands up when they see it happening so you don't get blindsided or it's not too late to ask. So a lot of that agile process and all that, you know, scenario planning is all for the purpose of being more innovative and being able to adapt more quickly because changes are going to be more, and there's more unexpected changes coming in the next 24 months than there ever has been, I think, in the previous 24 month period. So that's the thing that we've got to do. So how does your business fit into that future? Like, you know, what are the things that, um, uh, you can do to help your customers to achieve the things that you just just mentioned? Well, a lot of it was the stuff I was talking about. So um, it's really building this learning capability in the core of how you execute strategy. And uh, it's, it's kind of something that we've always done, but it's way more important now than it was in a more stable world. Um, so so that, that's the first thing. So build agility and learning into the way you do strategy. Uh, that's really critical. And then to underpin that, you have to do the things that always made a difference. You know, these authentic conversations, the ability to have a culture where people put their head up when they see issues are not working, um, and the ability of people to challenge their own thinking. You know, that, that sounds sounds strange, but it's really, really important. Um, you know, the way we see the world is filtered by how we frame every problem. You know, when, when you look at things that go wrong, we work with teams and we do uh, you know, a post-mortem assessment, like, okay, that was a bad, you know, that one didn't work, what the hell happened? You know, one of the things we do is we turn around and say, look, when we started this, how did you see yourself? What do you think you're doing? What do you think everyone else would think? How do you frame that? And what do you frame as your role? And, 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 uh, and, and those hidden, those assumptions behind there are the things that might limit how you approach it. So people have to get much better at reflecting, like, what are our strategic assumptions? What do I assume we could and couldn't do? Did I get that wrong? Because that, because you unconsciously use those to, um, to make decisions. And so a lot of uh, better reflection, um, better quality of uh, innovation and rapid learning, and, and, and we can help facilitate that because that's what our structure is designed on. It, and it, it may sound like uh, you know, self-serving or whatever, but there is a reason I spent you know, five years working with the folks at MIT on organizational learning back, back, in, back in the early 90s is because I really believe that was the key to building healthy organizations. And, and the reason that that was really powerful then and still is now, it's all about understanding how rapidly you personally can learn and, and make new decisions and deal with changing environments, but also how you collectively do it as an organization. So, you know, we, we see a lot of opportunities for us because we can build that, which is even more important now than, than, than before with, with the environment we're facing. Um, but but it, it, it's interesting in my mind, it's, it, it's what we've been trying to get people to buy into you know, for years. And, and in a stable environment, sometimes people think it's not so important. But um, when everything's thrown up in the air like this, you realize just how important that individual and team learning really is for success. So that, that's where, where, where we see us ourselves really helping, you know, our clients moving forward. So if, if I was to have a conversation with uh, one of your ideal customers that you, you've been working with in the past, um, perhaps the, the set top box company, what would they, how would they describe the key value that your business has provided them? Well, I think the way they describe the, uh, the key values is that, you know, they gave us fantastic structure and made strategy really concrete. You know, before we worked with reconsulting, our strategy was all over the place and no two people in the organization described the same way. 
once we had that, we were really clear. We knew where we stood all the time, and we were able to take corrective action whenever we needed to. Step one. Secondly, we really learned and developed as an exec team, and 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 and, and in fact, leaders we worked with top top two hundred leaders in the company over time. The top two hundred people built a culture of customer focus, delivery, and personal development. That, that's what they built, and that was key to our success. And you just got everyone excited everyone on the same page and we had a clear direction and we were able to execute on things that we really wouldn't have believed uh, be before we got there because you know before we had that process you know things were all over the place so i imagine um being a strategic consultant you you must be pretty good at getting your team on the same page as to you know how to deliver the best value so perhaps you could give us some sort of insights as to how you manage the people in your business to make sure that everyone's kind of aligned and um, delivering the best possible value. Well, yeah, I think, I think core, one, one core thing we do is everybody on the team has pretty deep experience, both in delivery and or development or, or both. So, so that people, the first thing we do is make sure everyone's got a good grounding in the stuff we do. So, you know, we don't have a, a kind of big pyramid with a bunch of junior people who we, we send out to try to hope they learn a job, job, job that way. So we, we, have, we have experienced people that, that really, that really uh, make, make it key. Secondly, we spend time kind of sharing our learnings and we kind of try to codify them. So we've taken all the things we've learned over the years and we've built it into what we call our strategy execution playbook. And, and we've learned there's several things that you have to have to deliver on strategy. If you're missing any one of them, you'll run into trouble. And we keep, periodically get together, we reflect on it, we build that out, and we built our playbook out over the years, and since everyone's familiar with it, and everybody sees the, the same elements of it, then uh, we, we all know we can focus our clients on, on the, same, the same, same, same type of things, as well as, of course, you know, learning and sharing and, 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 and training what we do. And, and with our Dutch colleagues as well, we focus on trying to share resources. You know, we're small, we're small practice, we've got, you know, so seven people and maybe six, 10 contractors, we use a lot. You know, so you got you know, 15 people involved that, that you're, you're delivering your, your clients on. But when we have work, I can find a contractor here perhaps for less than it costs to bring a Dutch colleague over. But my default is to bring you know, a couple of people from the Dutch team over so they learn and vice versa when, when they have jobs, jobs in Holland. So we consciously say, look, you know, we want to make sure that we share how we work together, we share the best practices that we're coming across. And, you know, we, we, we interact that way. So we put kind of building the capability together over, you know, kind of minimizing the cost of the, the resources we use in the project. So one of the most interesting questions I get to uh, ask um, is to, to imagine yourself in the situation where you could give some advice to your younger self. You know, what yeah. would be the, the key things that you've learned in your career to date that, you know, you think would be really advantageous to tell your, you know, maybe 20 year old or 18 year old or whatever age self um, to, to help you to do, do better or greater things. So what would, what advice would you give yourself? Well, for Probably lots of things, I suppose. I think, I, can, I think if you're going to run your own business, I, I, and I think it fits for anybody, is don't shy away from tough decisions. Um, you know, if you have something that's not, not working, and then face up to it. Like we had a situation in 2009 in the kind of big, or 2008 when the big financial crash came, where a lot of our work dried up. And at the time in London, we had about uh, 16 or 18 employees. And uh, it was pretty clear that, you know, we weren't going to cover our payroll costs for the next 12 months in, until we rebuilt the pipeline. So what, what we did is we got everyone together and I think a good thing we did is we basically put all the cards on the table and said, look, here's, here's the revenue we've been doing the last few years. Here's what's happened is it's fallen off the cliff. And you know, here's when we run out of money if we can't rebuild that pipeline. And we don't know whether we can or not. And so we said we have two issues. We can um, carry on and hope to rebuild the pipeline, but if that happens by September, if we haven't rebuilt it, we're going to be in a really bad place. Um, but, you know, we can do that if everybody thinks that's worth doing and maybe we can, uh, if people are happy to uh, have deferred salary and things and take the risk of doing it, then we can keep the whole team together. And we're willing to take that risk if you, you guys will. We understand fully if you can. Because our alternative is to, you know, basically fire half the people and make the business financially secure. Now, everybody said, yeah, I'm really happy to deferred salary. I think we should all work as a team. Blah, blah. We did that come September. We hadn't built the pipeline. And people weren't happy to defer their salary and it came in a complete car crash. And, you know, if I looked at that, what I would have done is just face up and say, look, if you're running a business and you run into problems like that, as painful as it is, it's better to make that tough decision up front than to try to uh, 
you know, find other ways around it. And, you know, and it feels bad at the time, but it, it would have been better to do that. So that was one thing I learned. And, and uh, also running a, a business, uh, particularly a small professional services business, but I think it upholds a lot, is I would make sure that you invest in marketing systems and processes and disciplines because, you know, people can set up, you know, the type of consultancy we have and be really great at delivering work to clients. But if you don't have a stream of clients, that's the lifeblood of your business. And that's the most important important thing. And you, you know, you basically lose, lose a lot of opportunities if you don't do that well. And uh, so we've learned that uh, building good marketing systems and processes and some discipline in that always feels like an um, extra thing to do when you're really busy and doing client work. But if you don't invest when in, in you need to, then, then, you, then you pay a price. Now, I can remember having, a, you know, we don't have the discipline. I remember seeing an old client who I didn't even know, but I knew she had worked at, at a client that we worked at about 10 years before, and I saw she just made chief executive. And I put a little note, and, you know, I, I must get in touch with her, see if she remembers us, because she, I'm sure she would have been involved in the project. But I never got around to doing it. About a month later, I got an email from her saying, I don't know if you remember me, but that stuff you did with us at Sky was the best project I've ever been involved with. Can you come and help me here? And, you know, she got in touch with me, but I wonder how many other times I didn't follow up the discipline and I missed opportunities that, you know, I could have had had I, had I been uh, being more disciplined. So discipline marketing is, uh, is an important thing. So tough decisions, discipline marketing processes and, and investing in that, I'd say, for business owners. For individuals, just, you know, this is more life advice, you know. <laughs> you know there's one, one thing someone introduced me a while ago is the uh, philosophy of the Stoics. And if you um, read a simple bit about, uh, about them, it, it's really good. Uh, it's, it, it's really, uh, it's actually really powerful stuff. And it's all about, uh, you know, recognizing, you, you know, you've only got one life to live, so live the life that you think is important. And don't worry as much what people think about you, worry about what you think is important. And build a good values-based uh, approach to, to um, to what you want to do and keep focusing on long term for that. And it's really, you know, it's really, it's really, it's really powerful stuff. So, you know, when you're 20, you don't need to think about stuff like that. But, but it pays dividends if you do. So, um, as you uh, look to, to grow your business, talk to me a little bit about the, the future plans that you, you have uh, for your company. Well, what we'd like to do is, as you alluded to earlier, we'd like to build a little bit more of a subscription and, and longer term uh, relationship model more so than, than we've done where we have done that in the past coming out of project type things where i think we've created more value for our clients and for ourselves so we want to accomplish and move closer to that and we're partly down the track with that i mean the development of the software that we did last year was the first step in that so we now have you know we have five clients who take that software on they're paying paying us monthly for those and we're trying to build that in, in as an integral part of our of our office so that's uh, kind of step one that, that we want to do. And we obviously want to have, um, you know, as I said, to build a marketing to fit with that. The other thing that we're trying to do is think about how we make the business scalable and, and add things that, that uh, make us more and more uh, valuable. So it's not, it would be an exaggeration to call it a platform strategy, but, you know, almost an analogy to that. You know, we do great stuff on, on strategy and leadership team development as a senior team and how you engage people in the organization. So we spent a lot of time with people asking for engagement. And so we're building technology um, plugins, so to speak, to our process where we partner with organizations that have interesting things that, that complement what we do and uh, give more value to our clients. So for instance, we have a partner, KeenCore, and they've got a fabulous software that, um, what it does is you can imagine if you're in a meeting and uh, tension goes up and, you know, and, and it gets really angry. You can see that in, in, in body language and you can hear it in the tone of voice. Well, it turns out you can do the same thing um, by seeing how people's tone of voice changes when they, when they write. Um, so you can use neuro-linguistic analysis to say whether tension and involvement is changing. Right? And, and, and so what KingCore does is rather than send surveys out that people get tired of, ask about engagement and climate and, and you know attitudes in the organization and where people put in what you want to hear rather than what they really think. What we do with KingCore is uh, we track all the um, digital digital messaging and email in your organization, anonymize it, but do AI language analysis on it to measure tension and involvement. And what it does is give you a baseline across the organization. So you go two years back and say, what's the normal baseline for this organization based on the actual language used in anonymized emails? And then how does it change? 
And if tension and, and involvement changes in one part of the organization, that leader is then responsible to respond to that. So it gives a real live objective, low cost uh, measurement of people and engagement daily, live daily message. So we build that in, into our offering. And we work on another software provider called Actionable. A lot of the individual change when you're really trying to make a difference to how you lead teams requires changes in behavior. And you know, one of the key things science is learning about that is from, from a neuroscience point of view is that you know, gateway habits make a big difference to um, how you learn to take on and sustain behavioral change if you're in a different environment. So at Actionable, we have um, apps that we get people when we go through a program with them on strategy and they say, well, what's the one thing you want to commit to doing differently with your teams to bring this to life? And they get daily, daily or weekly reminders on the app. They measure how, what they've tried. They reflect on what's working. So it kind of, kind of reinforces what's happening. So if I look forward, what we want to do is use our software and the other tools that we bring to it to really amplify the stuff we already do that works and to try to build longer term subscription based uh, relationships with the clients do that over a two or three year period than rather, rather than doing a project for six months. That's our, that's our kind of future so, right, is a look at that. So this next question is um, one of the most enjoyable ones from the gas perspective, because I'm going to pose you a fictitious scenario where I give you a hundred grand to invest in your business onto something that you hadn't necessarily budgeted for. I've yeah. got something in my mind, what I reckon you're going to say based upon your previous answers, but I'd be interested to know if someone gifted you a check for a hundred grand to spend in your business, what would you be spending that money on and why? Well, I'd have two, I have two options in my head when that comes to one thing that I might do, which, which might not be what you're expecting is a, uh, I might consider, if it, if it wasn't for COVID, I might consider doing some really high impact learning events. Back when I was in Anderson, I used to work with a collaborator that we had in Switzerland, and we did uh, work on creative leadership, how the leadership, how do leaders create uh, innovation and creativity in the organization. But we ran these fantastic conferences in Zermatt, and, and it was nice, you had CEOs fly into Zermatt during the ski season, uh, you know, we actually start the sessions at seven in the morning till 10. So you have a kind of three hour session and then, then off, off you go and ski and have lunch and you come back and they do something from four to seven. So it was a fantastic environment. It was a great learning experience. And so, you know, if I had a hundred grand suddenly extra to invest and, and, and COVID wasn't in the way, I might consider setting up one or two of those where we actually bring some interesting people together and build some good relationships and get some good insights. Um, but the other area, the other option I got would be around doing the next iteration of our software. So what we like to do is add, add, add um, video and learning content to the, the software so that we could uh, move towards a, um, a more standalone software package for smaller businesses that they said, we can't afford to hire you guys in to help facilitate. facilitate. Uh, we can only get a bit of your time, but we'd like to learn how to put a really good strategy playbook together. So we build uh, more of a, self-use, uh, here's your you know, strategy playbook in a box if you want to do it yourself. And that would be where we would uh, put the money in. Interesting. So we're pretty much at the end of our interview. We've just got a couple of quick fire questions for you. Yeah. So I'm going to kick things off with your favorite business book. Yeah, it's a called An Everyone Culture, Becoming a Deliberately Developmental Organization, which isn't a very big winner as a name, but it's <laughs> by, by Robert Keegan and Louise Leahy. And it's, it's a... It's a kind of update of the old Senge stuff, but it's a fantastic case study of three totally different businesses that have really put people in their development as the core piece of the strategy, not an add-on, and how it's made a fortune for them, but also created a healthy, high-performing organization in each case. And it, it kind of demonstrates all the things that we try to provide. So that's, and it's, an, it's a great book, and it's an easy read, and it's got great stories in it. So that one's a good one. So next question, your favorite quote. Yeah, it's not like a, a kind of famous person quote, but uh, I've used it a lot. Is uh, My favorite quote is this quote, the aim of this establishment is to create an environment where champions are inevitable. And uh, the reason I love that is uh, I worked with Lane for a kind of partner and competitor organization on a joint project. And, uh, and uh, Richard, who I was working with there, used that from one of his colleagues. And it was on the, uh, it was in the dressing room of the Stanford swim team in the U.S. And at the time, U.S. is most successful collegiate swim team. And that was their mission, you know, and it's like, and when I say to clients, like, when you try to put a purpose together and you put all these meaty mouth words, like that was both inspirational and really crystal clear. The only reason we exist is to create an environment where champions are inevitable and everything flows from that. You know, the training, the psychology support, the 
work ethic. And so I think that's a great quote. And, uh, it, and I basically say to clients, you can't come up with something like that, then, then, then you, maybe you should think about using it. And, and so you notice in, in our little kind of intro, I said, you know, we help work with CEOs to make it make success inevitable because that is a really powerful, powerful quote. So I like that. Lovely. So um, your favorite TED talk? Yeah, there, there's so many good ones, but the, the one, one I really love is Hans Rosling, but I, I never, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's the early days of TED, the best stats you've ever seen. And he is a fantastic uh, scientist and he had these big graphics uh, that basically showed how social and economic development happens over time. And it's a fantastic learning. It reframes a lot of development issues like from the global development and aid issues. And it's quite, quite amusing. But I also like the, the Shia Gassi one. It's a very old one as well called The Better Place, which is a fantastic idea for electric car infrastructure that failed, but it's still a great talk. <laughs> it's a really great reframing of uh, electric cars. So. Either of those were good ones. So who's inspired you the most in business? Uh, there's, there's, it's hard to say. Lots of people I come across are, but I, I worked when I was at MIT for a bit with a guy called Fred Kaufman, who uh, still publishes a lot. And he was quite an interesting guy, and uh, I always learned a lot from him. A little anecdote I always like is uh, we had like 50 people on this course working with him from all over Europe and, and Asia as well. And he said the first day, like, the one thing I'm asking everybody is, and we have come back from break, we have promised we'd be back on time. And, uh, and if you're going to be late, it's okay, just tell me. But I'm going to keep just the same number of chairs as you all here. And, and if somebody isn't on time, we'll wait till you're here until you start. So the very first break, first morning, one of my colleagues from Germany goes off and makes a 45-minute call to Hamburg. And uh, when he comes back in the office, you know, in the room, Fred's had us sitting there for 45 minutes. Everyone getting really pissed off, waiting for this one guy to come back. But he used it as a really powerful thing. He said, well, so when you guys make promises here, you know, uh, 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 is it BS or is it real? You said you would tell me or you'd be back. And now you've kept 45 people waiting. You know, so what is it like? And, and he, he has really powerful structures for uh, building a culture of accountability and you know, the little things you do. So anyhow, he's quite inspirational in other ways, but I don't know God, it was quite high impact and quite amusing. Quite amusing uh, output. So the, the last one, quick five questions is, yeah. Ezra Alive, who would you love to have as a mentor for you in your business? I, I think Peter Drucker, you know, he's, uh, he's had wisdom about so many things. But when you read from him, just kind of spot on. So, so I like that. Brilliant. So um, we're at the end of our interview. And last question is, is there anything you'd like to share with our audience that I haven't already asked you? Ah, not a lot. I guess I would say, um, I, I have a quote I always liked in that, in, and it's why reflection is important. It, it was a, I can't remember where I got this from, but someone said to me, you don't have thoughts, thoughts have you. And I think that was Fred Kaufman as well. And, and the idea is that uh, you know, our felt experience of the world is driven by our thinking about it. And yet we think we're actually seeing the whole picture. But our thinking and the way we think about things is really powerful. And if you want to be a great leader, you've got to become much more aware of your thinking and how you choose to respond to that. If you want to stay personally healthy, high energy, and, and build good relationships, then this is this is a nice quote I like. Perfect. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the, the best way of somebody reaching out to you? Uh, happy to email terry at reconsulting.com. You know, if anybody's interested, quite happy to um, hear, hear from people and, and get back from that way. Lovely. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Terry. And uh, it's been a pleasure interviewing you and I uh, hope to be in touch again sometime soon. Okay, Chris, thanks very much. Enjoy it. Thank you.